Welcome to the Future of Internal Communication podcast. I'm Jen Sproul, CEO of the Institute of Internal Communication. Our organizations continue to face an onslaught of challenges and the way we work requires dramatic transformation and response. Internal communication is a crucial function that helps organization achieve lasting change. It's also the glue that holds organizations together in hybrid and distributed working environments. This podcast explores opportunity for internal communicators in the future of work. The world is changing and so must we. We hope you really enjoy listening. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Future of Internal Communication podcast. I'm Jen Sproul, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Dominic Walters and Kat Barnard. And we're really excited today to bring back, I think this will be our second podcast together, Michael Heller and Joe Chick, who are leading on the fascinating research project, which is the Institutional History of internal communication from the 1880s. So Joe Chick is, uh, by way of introduction, the research fellow on the project, and he's currently uh, at Northumbria University. And Michael is principal investigator and also a professor at uh, Northumbria University. And I think myself and Michael, we started chatting, I'm going to say, could be five plus years ago about this project, quite some time. Yeah, we had lots and lots of chats. So it was really exciting last year when the funding go through. And Joe, I think we spent many times together in a lockup at the IOIC archive. So uh, we've got familiar over this project. So uh, hopefully that gives us good grounds for a conversation. So welcome. And as we know, this is the 75th anniversary year for the IOIC as well. So we thought it would be great to bring back Michael and Joe to give us an update on the project and all the things that they're discovering about the history of internal communication. So to kick us off, give Give us a bit of a recap of where we are on the history project and what have you uncovered since the last time we spoke? Okay, well, it's going really well, what we're doing at the moment. So we're in our second year now, started in October of 2022. So we've got two more years to go, ends in 26. We're basically in the data collection phase. All history really goes through three phases. Any project, any history research project is kind of your data collection uh, then your data analysis and then your data write-up where you then start producing your outputs from what we're doing at the moment is we're still it's big we're looking 20 archives that's huge i've been doing business history now for over 20 years i don't think there's ever been a project which has looked at which a has looked at so many archives at the same time and b has so many wonderful project partners such as the institute of internal communications i think what's really unique about this project is the depth and that's really really nice so to use a quite nice technical phrase in history we talk about diachronic and synchronic something is synchronic and diachronic diachronic is when you're looking at something in the past at a certain point in the past it's a diachronic you know if i was to look at the foundation of the british association of industrial editors in 1949 that would be a diachronic piece of analysis if that makes sense it's hitting a point synchronic is looking at a point in time across the time so what else was going on in 1949 does that make sense yeah but also synchronic can also link to the present i think so what i think is really nice about this project is it combines As Carlyle, the great 19th century historian, said, combines past and present. History is always a dialogue between the past and the present. Always. That's why it's fascinating. One of our co-investigators, Mick Rowlandson, he wrote in 1993 with John Hwasso, Professor Mick Rowlandson, he wrote, what was it, The History of the Histories of Cadbury. And he got the histories of Cadbury, but he looked at different histories written over different times because there'd been multiple. And, of course, those histories change. Because the way we look at the past is always different. The past is constantly changing in relation to the present because the present has different questions of the past. For example, the way we look at the past now, I mean, a key theme, and I know the IOIC is big on this, is well-being. You wouldn't have had well-being being looked at of a history of internal communications 30 years ago. Or was it just a different name or were we looking at it in a different way? Yeah, you would have actually. That's not true because Joe and I are writing a big paper on this at the moment, actually. And that, that is true, to be fair. It would have been called industrial welfare. And that was hugely about well-being. The idea that the past had no concept of well-being is... is, is. There's a book by a very important... He's like one of the founders of management thought in Britain. It was written in 1923, 24, and it's by Oliver Sheldon. 
the philosophy of management. And Oliver Sheldon was a was a manager at Roundtree. And Roundtree was huge, by the way, for developing all internal comms, industrial welfare. And Sheldon went on actually to set up the Institute of Labour Management, which is now the CIPD. So it's not Sheldon, sorry, one of his colleagues, but they were all vitalist. And in the philosophy of management, Sheldon talks about social responsibility. He uses that word and he talks about employee well-being. And he uses the word employee well, and the, the responsibility of, of employers to look after the well-being of their staff. But anyway, hand you over to Joe, because Joe's been doing the bulk of the research. But I think the two things we've done over the last year, which is huge, is we've done huge archival research. I think we've done about seven or eight, six or seven of archives. And we've also done tons and tons and tons and tons of engagement with our project partners. Oh, brilliant. Yes. We have obviously spent some time together in the archives as well. So, and I know we're already one of many. In all the reading that you have done, picking up from Michael, what what have you picked up so far? Anything that's really surprised you as well? Yeah, well, I suppose when we spoke to you at the podcast last year, we hadn't got that far of actually doing any research. Uh, I guess the organisations we've looked at have been uh, Unilever and Boots and John Lewis and the BBC we've looked at as organisations. But then, as you say, we've also been looking at some of the institutes that have actually helped to shape the practices. Uh, obviously, the IOIC has been one of those, and there's also been the CIPD and the CIPR and the Chartered Institute of Marketing. We had a, a quick visit to that as well, and I guess the kind of things we've been looking at so far. And I think probably one of the things that has surprised us has been how you see some of these themes that you think are quite modern ones are actually still appearing in some kind of form, and at least those discussions are happening quite a long time back. So as Mark was saying, we've been looking at this theme of uh, social responsibility is one thing where we found that actually after World War One, they're not necessarily using that term, but this uh, idea of industrial welfare is actually quite similar to what we talk about now as social responsibility. And this may be slightly different in that it's more focused on the employees rather than, than not quite as much on wider society. And I guess now you'd expect that to include the environment and things like that. But these concepts actually do go further back and actually sometimes the language we're using is what's changing. But then there's been other things like that as well, where we had one of our blog posts we wrote was about where we found the use of giving employees a voice. We found that a hundred years ago being spoken about as well, actually, in a magazine. And of course, you tend to think of employee voice as quite a recent idea, but a lot of these things, they exist in some kind of form earlier. But then obviously, sometimes the emphasis changes as well. So uh, another blog post we wrote was about personality testing. And some obviously, now there's sometimes interest in uh, some people specialise in how do you communicate with introverts and extroverts and different personality types. And Actually, there was a lot of interest in personality after the First World War, but industrial psychology was something that got spoken and written about a lot. But the emphasis was quite different because it wasn't really about necessarily trying to tailor to the actual employee and it wasn't about their well-being. It was more, how can you use this to mould your employees to fit an industrial process? So I guess sometimes you get the same themes, but subtle differences like that is what we found. I think it's that fascination, isn't it, of our language. See, there's the problems or how we label and talk about things has changed and evolutionised, but the fundamentals that are still there, that we want to be heard, that we want to be looked after. And we know that if we do all those things, that does create a better industry, if you like, and better looking environment. So that that's wonderful to hear. And I do remember as well, Michael, I think in one of our conversations many moons ago, and when we were talking about it, you said that all business is, is formed on chocolate and Quakerism. No, I said that. I thought there was too much <laughs> chocolate and Quakerism. <laughs> I have too much chocolate in my life. I know that much. But actually, I've kind of revised that view now, which is a nice thing. And actually, I think there is a lot of truth in chocolate and Quakerism. So we've got some very close colleagues of ours who are Maury McLean, Professor Maury McLean from Bath University and Professor Charles Harvey from Newcastle. And these, they are very senior figures in our field. We're actually hopefully presenting with them at the Academy of Management in Chicago. It's the biggest conference in the world. You're talking about twelve to 14,000 people will be at this conference. It's a big four-day conference. They've done really interesting research, which we're going to be using in our research. We're tapping in at a different angle, but we're doing of what's known as the British management movement in the interwar period. And I think this is a key milestone in the emergence of internal communication. And one of the things that I think history, and particularly business history for practitioners, is really good is that, and this is again what we mean by institutionalization. Institutionalization is embedded habits. So you do something and you think you've done it forever. It, it just becomes normalized. Does that make sense? So if you think about having a meeting, taking minutes to a meeting, but two questions are really interesting here. When did meetings actually emerge? right? 
And when did people start making minutes to me? Because that's all new. Romans didn't say, right, Tacitus, let's sit down and have a meeting and, you know, Plautus, you take the minute. It didn't work like that. But once we start doing something a lot, we tend to think, oh, well, we've always done that. Does that make, that's what we mean by institutional institutional history. But one thing which is fascinating, I, I picked up on this earlier, but we're really going into it now, is that management, having managers, and most of your colleagues, most of the people in the Institute of Internal Comps will either be managers or professionals that work with managers, right? You wouldn't have had the Institute without the emergence of management. This is really important, I think. Management is new. There was no management in the 19th century. It didn't exist. So what you would have is you would have owners. So this is very important in the history of business is at the end of the 19th century and into war period, you see the separation between ownership and control. That's really important. So who owns the company and who manages the company? That splits. Whereas in the 19th century, owners were controllers. Your owner controlled your... And that's another reason why company magazines and internal communication develops. Because whereas before owners had this kind of very paternal the employees were almost like his children they had this very close bonded relationship when you see that split between management and there's this fear that there's going to be a disconnect between management and employees so they start then trying to develop forms of communication that could do that so and what's really interesting is that maureen charles they've looked at the british management movement in interwar period, and it is actually i'm afraid chocolate and Quakers. It's all from York. So they start having management research workshop groups in the interwar period. All these managers come together. They start doing lectures, the round tree lectures. And actually, Joe talked about industrial psychology. We use a lot of this stuff. The first organization in Britain that employed psychologists and, and had a personnel department was the Chocolate Works at York. Can I just butt in? Because I think this is so, so interesting. When We do our work at Working the Future. We look at the history of organisational structures and we try and understand the future of work through the lens of what we've seen work in the past. And a lot of the framing of management, as I read it, seems to hinge upon the work of Frederick Winslow Taylor, who obviously was American and wrote his scientific very early 20th century. But who then, guys, in your opinion, would be the British equivalent of him? Who was influential in the UK? Roundtree, without doubt. So the establishers of modern management in America, but then the American stuff comes over to the UK, so it all gets... And the British stuff is going over to America, by the way. There's all of this cross-flowing stuff. You know, in the 19th and early 20th century, British companies, particularly railways, but other companies, Cadbury, would send fact-finding missions to America. And they'd go over there and go, what are you doing? And the Americans would do the same. They'd come over here. So there was a lot of this interchange of information. But in America, the founders of modern management, without doubt, are Frederick Taylor with the the emergence of scientific management. And what that does, basically, just to explain that to your viewers, what happens is the British are the first people that, well, we invent factories. We come up with the idea, hey, we're going to put all production in a building, right? Before that, production was done in people's cottages. It was called cottage industry, right? And merchants would give them cotton and then they lend them this is like the gig economy which is coming back now and then they would give them something to spin with they'd give the machine and they'd spin stuff and they'd collect the stuff and then what happens in the 18th century is with the development of steam energy all of that's put in a factory what the americans do is they take that one step further right and they start internalizing all transactions so marketing is now done by them management is done by them hr is now done by them you see they start really internalizing everything and that leads to these huge corporations like ford and dupont that's why america becomes this huge power what happened was is your workers would work in a factory in a steel factory or in a coal mine they wouldn't be managed you would have almost subcontracting they would come in and do and they were skilled workers they'd all done apprenticeships right so So it's actually the workers were managing other workers, not the owners. So you'd have like a master craftsman coming, working, uh, he wouldn't be managed, and then he would bring in apprentices into the company. Now what Taylor does is he gets rid of that system. 
and he looks at how these people work. He was an engineer tailor, you see. He worked in a steel plant. And at that time, all steel work was subcontracted. And he did time motion studies. He looked at how a worker did a piece of work. And he recorded that. And then he said, right, everybody has to do that. And managers implemented that. And so what Taylor does is he kind of de-skills workers. If you look at McDonald's, I used to work at McDonald's years ago. You have like a time motion book. It shows you the motions you have to do to get the chips into, but you know, these time motion studies that you do. Now, at the same time, as Joe said, the other founder of modern management in America is um, a German called Munsterberg, right? Hugo Munsterberg. And he brings in industrial psychology, basically personnel management, and also Dill Scott. And the important thing here is the First World War. For the first time, they start bringing in psychometric tests. We can scientifically work out who are the best workers, how to train them, how the control of bodies is by Taylor and the control of minds is by Dill Scott and Munsterberg. That's the basis of management. In Britain, it's basically the round trees that do this. They pick up on industrial welfare. Oh, and the other person, the, the Hawthorne studies. So that's really famous. So the Hawthorne studies is the biggest ever study. This is the human relations movement. So that emerges. So Western Electric, which is a huge factory of 40,000 people, that gets studied by, they're from the Harvard Business School, it's Mayo and the Human Relations Group. And they do this huge study from like 1928 to 1933. And what they do is they're kind of arguing against Taylor because Taylor's treating people like machines and the human relations group say, no, 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 you have to treat people like human resources. You have to look at what they call the human factor in production. You can't just mechanize people, right? They call it the human factor in production. And what they discover is social man. They say that employees have social needs, yes, when they're at work, they work in groups, they have social needs. And if employers do not meet those social needs, you don't get engaged workers. So all of these words we can see now, engagement, employee commitment, empl this is from the human relations. So it comes in three stages. You've got Taylor, that's all the efficiency. He's an engineer. Then Munsterberg and Dill Scott, they're the psychologists. And then the human relations movement are the sociologists. So there you go. That's a potted history of management. Fantastic potted history. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, because that leads us neatly, I think, into this area about some of your findings around what's most boosted internal comms. We were, funnily enough, having a debate, a few of us the other day, about what one thing, looking back over the last few decades, has most accelerated the impact and acceptance of internal communication. I think there were three schools of thought broadly. One was about tech, people saying without all the great tech we've got at the moment, we'd never be able to reach people, they wouldn't be able to talk back, we wouldn't be able to have the exchange. Another one, I think, builds very nicely on what you've just been saying, was around management and leadership. The fact that it's certainly the last three or four decades, there's been much more interest in leadership, or it's come to the fore anyway. And the last one, perhaps a bit tongue-in-cheek, someone actually said they thought it was the Profumo scandal in 1963, which many people will know was a great British political scandal. But the reason they mentioned it was it, it started to erode deference and trust. And that, that accelerated such that people no longer accepted what their leaders would say. And we've seen that get worse and worse, more, sorry, get more and more, should I say. So those are the three different takes on what's accelerated. It's probably a combination of all of them. But going back over your research, what would you say, if you can, what the one thing has been that's most changed the face of internal comms? I think it's two, because remember what we're doing is we're actually saying that internal comms goes through two big phases and um, we talk about kind of logics so that sounds technical but it doesn't all that means is how it works how you understand something what's the logic of you know if you think in marketing obviously jen's from marketing background if you, if you look in the past marketing had what was called a product centered logic it was all about make a good product and then the role of marketing is just to sell that product it's called selling and telling whereas in the 60s, 70s, that logic shifted to what was called a customer-centric logic, which was, so now you do not begin with the product. You begin with the customer, you understand the needs of the customer, and then you develop a product around that, and then marketing is all about understanding needs, satisfying needs, communicating them, and then developing relationships. 
internal comms kind of does something very similar. So the problem with that question of what was the most important thing, which of course all your listeners are going to ask, the problem with that is it conceives of internal comms as being static. It's like that's internal comms and it just starts here and it goes. In. It doesn't. It starts, it goes, it suddenly shudders and changes. It reforms itself and then it becomes something else. So I would say in the first phase, without doubt, the most important factor was the rise of the large scale organization the growth of these huge organizations. So just to put that into context, the Prudential Insurance Company, when I did research, I think 1870, it had about 1,000 workers. By 1914, it had 20,000. That's incredible. You see these corporations just go bang. And within the growth of those large-scale organizations, they develop internal labor markets. So the idea that you work for a company for life, you have an internal, and your children do as well, and you, you have pensions and you have company sport, a sense of company identity, the internalization of labor, that's the fundamental basis of communications. But then in the 60s, it suddenly changes. And we go from an editorial logic, it's all about magazines. And you know that shift, it's in your organization because you used to be called the British Association of Industrial Editors. So you were following an editorial logic, but then you shifted to the next logic, which is the internal communication logic. And now you are the Institute of Internal Comms. So what we're arguing is even in your name, we see that shift. And I think in the 60s, without doubt, it's about the collapse of deference. It's about the empowerment. You remember what Macmillan said in the 50s. It's about the emergence of an affluent society. People have money. People are more educated. You can't talk down to people. And then you see the emergence of two-way communication. And employees now have voice. I will have a go at naming one factor if you want that I think has it's been maybe the main shaping thing, but this is one that could apply at all ages. And I think this is a question we've been asked a few times across the years, so I've kind of had to think about it a few times. And I think probably, and it's probably not a good answer for internal comms, but I think crisis is probably the main thing that's shaped internal comms. Because I think where it's each stage where it seems to have developed a lot, usually it's been in response to a crisis. So we've been talking quite a lot about after the First World War and how you got the there were kind of like councils that were created during the First World War, where essentially the government's trying to take over British industry to run it more efficiently. But also at that time, of course, you've got the rise of trade unions and there'd been the Russian Revolution. And at the time, there was genuine concern among managers that, that something similar might happen in Britain. So actually, a lot of the communication developments that happened then was their concern about a potential crisis and responding to that. And again, I guess you have further developments after the Second World War, where again, there'd been Obviously, all the kind of propaganda that had been going on had been uh, quite an influential thing in shaping ideas about communication. And we've been talking about the 60s and 70s. Of course, that's again when you're starting to get industrial action happening again. And a lot of kind of new methods that were getting brought in then were in response to how can you have more harmonious industrial relations. And then I suppose the most recent one uh, would be, and I guess most people working here would agree, would be the pandemic and lockdown. And of course, we said technology shapes things, but a lot of technology wasn't actually really getting used to the best of its ability until there was a crisis. And then that's when suddenly things came in. So I'd say maybe if you're going to name one thing, I think probably it's crisis, which I don't know what the message is then for that, whether you need to create a false sense of crisis when you want to bring in changes. Or <laughs> well, it does. If I just I pass on to Kat in a second, if I just comment on that, because as you know, one of the debates that internal communication has within us as a professional is who do we serve? Do we serve the organizations or do we serve the people within the organizations? And I think the real answer is somewhere between the two, I guess. But what you're saying is what's driven the growth of the profession is the need of organizations to communicate with their people because either there's lots of them, they've grown, and or because there's fear that a crisis is going to get out of control or people need to know what's going on in the crisis. So perhaps what's driven the profession has been the needs of organizations. But within that, from what you're saying, we also need to understand that we're not just the mouthpieces of organisations. We have to work with people who are not going to blindly accept what we say. I think so. I mean, I think what has really driven internal comms, and, and actually, I mean, what I said earlier, I think it is that. I mean, I think Joe is absolutely right when he talks about these triggers. You know, history, a lot of history is really about causation. It's what's causing something, right? And we're trying to find these. I'm sure you remember at school, you know, I say, what caused the Industrial Revolution? What was the cause of the Second World War? And that it's true. I mean, a lot of history is about causation. I think Joe's right there. And don't forget one other crisis there in the 60s. When we see that shift in the 60s and 70s, it's, you know, and which is very apposite to today, isn't it, really? It's the inflation 
of the 60s, the oil crisis, the mass inflation. And that's when you start seeing this word internal communication. You see that shift from magazines, that editorial logic goes because they realize that you can't use magazines anymore to manage affluent workers who demand a voice back. And that collapse in deference and also people who were just going on strike the coal strike the you know and obviously um it's interesting these big figures who pop up so you know is it lord rogers was in the coal national coal board he is a huge figure in the 70s 60s and 70s and, and it's fascinating if you look at the shape of magazines they go from these very kind of glossy things to tabloids we were in unilever you had the the lever mirror and again it, you have the courier and they bring in editorial teams. And really a remnant of that still is John Lewis, isn't it? John Lewis still has huge editorial teams with their magazines, and they run them almost independent. The Aerial used to be a good example, you know, where magazines had an independent... And that goes back, Dom, to what you're saying about, is the magazine the mouthpiece of the management, or is it serving the work? You see that. But I think what it is is that there is this realisation which develops around 1900, which is when the internal communication is, the, the magazine is being developed, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that your employees aren't just capital. They're not just someone who works for you, but there is a growing awareness that employees are strategic resources, and that if you develop your employees better than your competitors you will have competitive advantage. Does that make sense? And that, and that idea that your workers will be more productive, there'll be lower turnover, they will strike less, they will be more committed. And that discourse in the 1990s and 20s, even now we see it with social media, internal social media, which is really changing. As well. Your employees will become ambassadors, brand ambassadors. They will go out and spread the word. This idea that somehow... If you create what was earlier called industrial goodwill, by the way, that used to be its early name, we now call it employee engagement and motivation. And that's why I think companies started plowing lots of money into, I think before it was almost, it was caught up in that industrial personnel profession, used to be called the Cinderella profession. <laughs> it's, oh, You will go to the ball. But it was kind of looked down on a bit. It was never seen as, and now, you know, marketing strategy is more important. They're the people who arrange the Christmas party and whatever else, and they bring out the magazine. And then I think over time, they change themselves to human resource management. But I think there's always been this idea that employees are a resource and if organisations use them better. I'm just going to jump in as well. I saw this in our archive the other day, which is a BAEIE, one of our old association, and the headline, this is 1979, and the headline says, industry must work hard at internal communications. Just thought it was the first time I'd seen it said in that way. So I just thought, relates so much to what you're saying. It's incredible. It really does. And I think the government was part of that. I mean, I'm sure a lot of your listeners, I mean, we were watching The Crown again last night, you know, it's in its last series, really. And I think what that has done very well is kind of show Prince Philip. Yeah, I'm mean, sure you know that. Philip was a huge figure in the British Association. He was one of the patrons of... And the other big change I think that happens is after the... There he is there. That's in our magazine, the company and the individual. So what you have after the Second World War, and you still have that, is obviously the McLeod report is a classic, is the government gets involved in it. The government starts saying to business, you need to have better relationships with your workers. So after the war, it's about productivity. There's a huge balance of payments crisis because we owe so much money to the Americans for. So there's a huge emphasis on productivity and the government gets involved with this in internal communications. And then obviously in the 70s, it's about getting rid of strike action. Then in the 90s, 2000s, it's about engagement and so forth so i think that's really interesting as well how internal comms has become politicized that i think is interesting i think what is so interesting about this and by the way creds to you guys because you make mrs bowen and mr richmond really dull as dishwater and that's why i was disinterested in history at school but i could listen to you guys literally all day but i think what is so interesting when i think about the past, present and future of internal communication is Joe's point about crisis 
as a driver of change in the way that we communicate internally. Because yes, the pandemic was another crisis point. But since the pandemic, we seem to be bearing witness to somewhat of a mass unravelling. So some examples that I could include there, obviously, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, disruption of previously assumed secured international supply chains, the escalating climate crisis, cost of living crisis, which is obviously to do with those international supply chains and failing crops due to climate change, all of these kind of interconnections and convergences. And what we're seeing now in real time is a rise of employee activism. So a willingness to call out perceived inaction or inappropriate action by business leaders. There was an article in, I think, The Guardian just before Christmas about students on university campuses boycotting one of the major UK banks for its continued financing of fossil fuel industries. There was also an article produced by the BBC about the rise of climate quitting, where young adults are just walking out of organisations that they perceive to be not taking a forceful enough stand on climate, carbon emission reductions and so on. And I think all of these things are bubbling under. So I think we are arriving at another, you know, the crisis that was 2020 and the outbreak of the pandemic is transitioning into what the World Economic Forum has called a polycrisis or a permacrisis. I think we're hearing those turns of phrase become more prevalent in mainstream discourse. So I think the shape and nature of internal comms is going to change again. And when I'm listening to you guys about the history all of a sudden, like lots of light bulbs are going off in my brain. And I can see on both of your faces, you're so animated when you speak about what you have discovered. So my question would be to each of you, at a personal level, what has been your most fascinating discovery in the last 15, 18 months? Maybe too hard a question because there's been so many. Do you want to start actually, Michael? That's a good question. This sounds a bit rubbish, but it kind of goes back to what Joe was saying about continuities rather than breaks. So things that we thought were new have kind of been a lot older than what we thought, if that makes sense. And I think that's something very reassuring. I was amazed when we were looking at this, looking at this emergence of this kind of social responsibility. We knew it was there before, but it really came when we were at at Boots at, at Unilever and some of the stuff Joe's done more research in the industrial welfare society and also one other thing and we kind of touched on this is the marketing we tend to think of internal comms going into mark in the 80s and 90s we've spoken to mark Wright, for example he spoke about sheep dipping in there where they kind of dip workers in what was his name ollie in the 80s that corporate identity there was all of these big changes going on. We've actually found that that's been happening earlier on. The companies, they weren't doing it as extreme, but they were using internal comms to market with. So, But one thing I know, and I know this from when I was commissioned to write the history of the University of Westminster, when it went Regent Street. One thing that we found, and I think that is really interesting when you look at what's called the long jure of history. You look at history over a long period. What you actually see is... And that's the weird thing about history. It's a combination of stability and change at the same time. So some things just stay the same and other things completely change. It's just completely weird. So, you know, when we looked at the the University of Westminster, it still had the same mission statement of educating people from poorer backgrounds, disadvantage of levelling up, but other things were different. You've seen that, I think, with internal comms. So I think for me that it's quite reassuring of that history is kind of doing what it's meant to do, but it is quite incredible as well. And before we go on to Joe, I just want to say, and thank you so much for underscoring that, because that is a golden nugget for us 
to take forward into the future of internal communication, actually, a golden thread that while things change, other things remain constant over time. I think that's really valuable for us to remember. I think I really do. Just become a professor of business history now, and it's nice, you know, that key turning point of your career to reflect and look back. I started doing research in 96, you know, it is 27, 28 years of research there and looking at archives and writing. You know, I've written about 30 articles, books, chapters, where there's a lot of stuff that I've actually produced over that period. And it's funny that the more you do something, you start. There's that lovely line in the Bible where Paul says, what was it, first I see through a glass darkly, but now I see through a glass clearly. History, some things start clarifying, if that makes sense. But I think that's important for organisations, because one thing I've seen in a lot is Joe talks about crises, you know, and he's right. The history of business has been a history of crisis, continuous crisis, and having to react to that. But I think businesses need to be very careful because sometimes you don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater. You don't want to throw everything out. Some things they have to continue and other things have to change. Good management should be about continuity and change, not about change, and particularly not about change for the sake of change, which we see in a lot of organised. And then, of course, a lot of employees go through kind of change fatigue, don't they, you know, where organisations are constantly trying to reinvent themselves. I think that's very bad. I I think that is a wonderful anchor, actually, because we're all submerged right now in a very strong Silicon Valley narrative, which is that technology is going to continue to accelerate and enforce continuous disruption and change upon us. And while I don't dispute that that may be true, What I think we should be looking for as internal communicators is the constants, the things that remain continuously consistent over time. I think that's a really lovely anchor point for us to all hold on to. But I'm very aware, Joe. I haven't asked you the question and I can see you waiting to chime in. What's been your most interesting discovery? Like I say, I suppose there's been lots of interesting ones, but I was thinking one particularly interesting thing was when we were looking at Unilever, or as they were called at the time, Lever Brothers, who were soap manufacturers, essentially, because some of the earliest magazines we've looked at come from then. And I think looking at ones right at the start of the 20th century, seeing how strategic they were with their use of words right from the very start. These weren't just things they had done for the sake of it. And I think what was interesting in particular is sometimes around that era, we talk about uh, something called paternalism, which is basically where I guess companies are kind of, I guess, treating like their workers like children almost, so kind of acting as their kind of like protectors. And of course, the word Peter is the Latin word for father. So it's, it's referring to like family, that word. And what's interesting is how they literally do use lots of words to do with family in their writing. We found extracts from there where they're talking about the apprentices as being their children or something like that. I think that this was uh, Lord Lever, who was the head of the business, talking about that. And they started to talk about, because they have this big manufacturing site, the kind of huge task there was doing the laundry of all the overalls for the workers each week. And they refer to it as the family laundry, this thing that they're doing. And they talk about how we managed to do the family laundry. And then also they built this town for their workers called Port Sunlight. And they certainly kind of talk about it as a kind of community with, again, a kind of family spirit. And that's quite interesting because then one of the podcast interviews that we did with our series was with Alex Kaput, who I met actually through the IOYC Festival. And it was interesting because he did a PhD on anthropology and his kind of special kind of thing is like the rhetoric of family. So he has then been looking at it in modern day organisations. And one of the interesting things he said about its use in modern day organisations is that in a way it can be slightly predatory kind of using that language because it breaks down boundaries between employers and employees by making it sound like you're all a kind of happy family when you're not necessarily. And I thought it was particularly interesting seeing kind of a lot of the same strategic language being used right at the start of the 20th century in the earliest magazines that we'd looked at and that the same kind of thing sometimes gets used in a strategic way today. So interesting. Thank you. And it is just brings about that point around language and what we say and how we say it and how we use it how intentional 
perhaps with around it and what we're trying to get out of it. And I think I see many modern day debates over the word family being used in business and it can have definitely some negative reactions as well as that. But also as well, I think one of the things we've spoken about as well is how more brands actually, particularly those older ones, are tapping into their own heritage to drive that sense of identity in today. You know, we've seen that quite a lot, how do brands use their heritage to drive that sense of culture and identity and language and and standing out. And that's something that's uh, uh, certainly being, I see, more featured of um, uh, certain the entries. Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought that up, Jen, because actually we haven't really spoken much about this. Now we're on the other podcast, but we're doing a lot. Actually, if you look at our research project, it's really looking at It's looking at three things, I would say. On the one level, which we've spoken about a lot, it's about the history of internal communications. And that's probably the basis. But on the other level, it's also talking about the professionalization of internal comms. So how internal comms has professionalized throughout its history. It's a history, and I think that was missing in the past. We tended to look at internal comms as just this object, this phenomena. But what we were missing was that the motor that was driving that was the increasing professional, which is still ongoing. It's not like, oh, it happened and, it, and then everybody professionalized, everyone was happy, and then they kept pushing her up the hill. It hasn't. That, that process professionalization is ongoing and ongoing, and that's fascinating. But the third thing we looked at, and Joe's actually writing a really good paper on this. He's written something, and we're really proud. This is our first public, although Joe has written tons of stuff, our first academic paper, and we're actually going to hopefully present it in Chicago. So we'll be mentioning you guys in Chicago at this huge conference, the biggest management conference in the world, the Academy of Management. And that's looking at what's called rhetorical history. And rhetorical history is really, really interesting. That's our third question. So the first one is about the history of internal comms. Second one is about professionalization of the history of that profession. The third one is about, and rhetorical history is not actually about the past per se. It's about how organizations in the present use their past. It has other words, heritage is one like heritage branding. So we've seen with the London Underground, 175. Lots of companies mark their anniversaries. But the use of past and present, and managers realizing that the past is a resource because all organizations have pasts by being organizations. They have to have pasts. But some organizations use their past better than organizations. They use that as a real... If you think of an organization like John Lewis or Cadbury, they really, you know, they have heritage centers, visitor centers. An amazing museum, which if you haven't been, you should go and your listeners should go, is the Museum of Brands in London, which is an incredible museum. And you really see some organizations and what they would do is that they would celebrate the country's history and their history we often see this a lot in what you call it jubilees royal jubilees so marmite they renamed it for the one it was mom might mom you know and if you go to the museum of brands you really see that that they would bring out biscuit companies chocolate soap companies. they would tie their history to the nate to give them legitimacy to enhance their corporate brand now one thing there has been a lot of work done on brand heritage and rhetorical history but what's missing a lot is the way that internal communication was the vehicle to communicate that rhetorical history. And that mixes up with something which I think is fascinating, which isn't history. It's linked to organizational studies, and that's organizational memory. It's called OMS, Organizational Memory Studies. And this is a fascinating question, which I don't think in internal comms you guys haven't looked this either, but is how do organizations remember and how does internal comms help organizations remember and why memory is so important to an organization. Well, you've given us a whole area now to explore, I think another topic area for IOIC to have a look at, but it is fascinating. And we are here releasing this podcast today on IOIC's 75th anniversary because, and we're trying to expose that, our heritage, because even though we are well aware we're in the present, but we think it, it helps build confidence, gravitas, credibility, all those things. And I think as a professional community internal comms, one of our aspirations is to have a more confident 
profession. And so all of that, kind of that memory piece or knowing where that comes from. So when I talk about the project, when I'm out and about to members, the sort of the faces when you sort of go about the history and the longevity, not necessarily of IOIC, but of our professional community, it does something in terms of that pride and that gravitas, absolutely. But you do as well. And I think that's something, and I think you are probably the oldest internal communications profession in the world or you're either the oldest or the Americans may have got, because your history actually goes back to the 30s, because you were formed in 1949. But before that, there was another organization which you formed yourselves out of. There was a pre org which was the House Organs Institute, and they were you. So you were formed. So what happened in 49 is the people from the House Organs Institute got together and said, right, we're going to disband us. We're, no longer, we're now going to call ourselves the... So you are really old. You're nearly hitting 100, actually. And that's something that... Well, now we've got to rebrand the whole campaign, Michael. I've got a whole logo and everything. You're 75. Don't worry. They're not the same organisation. You were grounded in. Those members of that organisation, it's not like they just changed their name. They came and they created a much bigger organisation. And actually, if you look at the House Organ Editors Institute, what's important about them is they were mainly concerned with customer magazines. So most of their members, so what happens in the interwar period is you see this huge growth in customer magazines, customer publications, right? You see it in the car industry, you see it in the gas industry, interestingly, in the electrical industry. So companies start writing magazines and they hand them out free to, mainly to housewives, to develop a sense of engagement, of loyalty. Today, we would call that content marketing. What happened was that got so big with these magazines being written, these editors. So people from the newspaper industry started working in companies. And then some of those editors started writing internal magazines as well. And they formed that association. But it was primarily about customer magazines with some company magazines. And then members of that group then formed yours. But you could argue that your roots go even further back, if that makes sense. Well, I'll use that. I'll use that, Michael. I'm not afraid. Jen and I, we've had lots of conversations. You were really important for us getting, the IOC and you were really important for us getting that grunt, really. And and one of the things that we kind of emphasised was you're a really old organisation. And it's not a critique of your members who were wonderful, but... There's a lack of... There's a lack of awareness of that heritage. Absolutely. And hopefully we can do more of that. So with the heritage in mind, if we could have just your thoughts on this next question. So we've got all of this and with the thought of stability and change and all the things that we've spoken about. Where do you think internal comms will head next? Joe, can I come to you? Have you had any thoughts about where you think we're going to go next? What's going to keep being stable or is it what's going to change? Well, I suppose the thing that everyone's talking about at the moment is AI, obviously. And uh, we've got been writing an article for Voice magazine, in fact, that will be coming out later this year on the impact that new technologies had. And in that, we've kind of then looked at the past and uh, when new technologies come in. And one of the things we found with that is that actually quite often there's a big rush to introduce the new technology and lots of thought like, how can we use this? And sometimes it doesn't get used very well at first because uh, people are using it for the sake of it. And some of those actual kind of fundamental principles of good communication that don't actually change then end up actually getting overlooked and forgotten about for the sake of trying to use new technology. So I think uh, with so much new technology coming on now, that's going to be one of the challenges, really. So I guess there's people are going to have to be thinking, how can we actually use this in a strategic way that actually helps those kind of principles of good communication? And so I think the new technology will be important because there's always something that can be gained from these, but trying to understand exactly what it is and how that supports all the things we already know about communication, actually, is so that it's building on those rather than forgetting about them and using things just for the sake of it. No, Joe, it comes back to human relations. Technology can't, it can help support us, but it doesn't do human relations and those things, those language and those words and all the heritage and history that we've spoken about that's really important, but how can it help support what we're trying to do, not hinder it? And it is that judgment of how those two. I know, Michael, have you got any thoughts about where you think um, IC will head next? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's interesting because I've picked this up really from engaging with you guys. And I really love that. I think academics have to come out of their ivory towers. You know, if we want to be serious about business research, we have to engage with business. It's as simple as that. We can't just sit in an office and say, well, this is what's happening. It's a strategy. And so got to be in a constant dialogue. One thing that I've picked up from you guys, and also we went to a very good conference from Simply Communicate also, that was, we were picking up, it was there as well, is this idea of a shift from 
internal common professionals as creators of content to curators of content. And that's come up in the podcast as well. I really think that's what the shift is. And in 2004, there was a a mind-blowing article that was published in marketing by Vargo and Lush. It, It really was what we would call one of these discourse changed. And it was written by two scholars called, I think that article is now the most cited article i think it's been cited about sixty thousand times or so and it's called service dominant logic service dominant logic and they said that marketing had shifted to a service dominant logic and their argument was was that marketing is fundamentally about creating services for people so even a car is not a car it's not a product it's just something which provides a service of getting you from a to b right everything now is shifted to this service dominant logic so that was their big, big idea. But within that, they came out with another idea, which has probably become bigger, is the concept of co-creation. And so what they said was that, if you think about this, historically, marketing has been about producers and consumers, right? And about how producers can control consumers, get more consumers, get loyalty and sell them products and blah, blah, blah. And that's very similar internal comms. Don was talking before about this kind of semi-tension about all this question. Is it about the organization, the management, or is it about the consumers, the employees? Where does the balance lie? Now, what happened was there was that shift and it was like, no, it's about the customers, but the organizations produce the products and the customers still consume the products. That always been the case. What they're saying now is that has changed and products are now being co-created. And what happens now is it It's no longer about a business to a customer. It's about networks of customers with social media. They're all networked together and they're all creating content. And so what happens is the business and the customers create value together by their co-creation. I think that's happening in internal comms. And I think that process will just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I think that's the future. So it is curation and it's co-creation. And I just want to chime in on that. I think that has just, again, sparked a whole bunch of light bulbs for me, but almost to that point. And I think it is featured in maybe some literature that was created by Eric Rees, who wrote The Lean Startup. But definitely there is a story in one of his books about I'm sure it was Dropbox. Dropbox, when it first set up, could not get funding. It really struggled to get funding. If it wasn't Dropbox, forgive me, Dropbox, but they couldn't get funding and they had to carry on on a skeleton budget. And they invited early adopter users to help them shape and hone the products. And they entered into this active engagement with these early adopters who were almost like their beta tester community and effectively got to a critical mass where all of a sudden, not only had they honed the product offering, but they also had this kind of entourage, this big following, whereby suddenly the VC funders turned around and went, oh my God, actually, there's something really credible about what's going on here. And so that story has been told as a kind of prototype example of lean and agile product development in early phase startups in the software arena and this interaction between the organization and voluntary engagement with these early adopters to shape and hone is a really strong example of organizational agility and motion. So I really like the fact that you've then tied that back into what internal comms could be, if minded to be. I do think so. And I think that going back to what I was talking about before about this concept of history as a process, continuity and change, which is happening at the same time. We know that this has been going on. This idea that your employees are resources. And if only the organization could develop a system of internal comms to channel those resources, those abilities. This goes back to things like the development of suggestion boxes. When we were in Unilever, we found uh, archive documents on the development, huge files on the development of suggestion boxes, which were taken very, very seriously by companies a hundred years ago and we've seen that continue the idea of team working of employee councils of harnessing the energy of employees into the organization so we operate more together that's been going on for a long time and it's continuing and i think this concept of internal comms as a way to access the energy to make your companies more creative more engaged more productive more brilliant and then 
this idea now that what social media has done, what Web 2.0 has done, that it's enabled employees now. Because you see, the problem was before, even though there was a realization of that, the technology wasn't there. The internal comms people still produced the content and the, the employees still read it. You had a few things like John Lewis and the employee letters were important. Right. And we know from our research that the most read in the past part of the company magazine was always the letters. They loved the letters. Right. So that was an early form of user generated content, if that makes sense. You know, people talk about AI, but I would argue that we've taken our eye off the ball seriously. I think social media is the big thing. Social media is still young. It's only been around for 20 years. Businesses have only used it. Internal social media is very, very young in organizations. It's only been around for 10, 15 years. It's in its infancy, that technology. It's implicated. And I think if you combine the social media with the AI, I think that's your future. It's your employees creating it and, it, and your IC people kind of curating and creating some of their own content and throw internal comms people will still create content. I think, Michael, you're doing a trailer for our third podcast, I think. A hundred percent. Sorry, because I am that geek squad and I am in awe of you two history boys. So I had to go and just verify it was Dropbox. And they use the lean startup methodology to create a minimum viable product. This comes back to, and I think this is a wonderful kind of almost footnote for this podcast. You can see me getting animated now. If internal communicators have the courage to experiment with what could be possible, but create new service offerings at a minimum viable level and invite that co-creation process with their internal stakeholders, their internal audiences. And I use those words quite specifically because I think slowly but surely we're shifting away from employees towards multiple internal stakeholders who will hold a range of different employment contract types. But that experimentation, the curiosity, but also the key skill here, the meta skill, which I know we've talked about a lot on air and off air, the meta skill is listening to what people are saying they want and building services around that in that MVP capacity, the minimum viable product to test and measure to see what works. And I think what you just said about the social media, internal social media platforms, I think there is the potential that AI can scrape and inform, but actually for now, it's still in its infancy and our human capacity to tune in and listen is the most important skill set that we've got in that regard, I think. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I really do. And a big part of my research actually over the last 26 years, 28 years, has actually been looking at the impact of technology. My PhD was actually on clerical workers. And, that, and you know, that's how we got into internal comms, actually. That's how I got into it. So, And I published a book on this, on the um, history of clerical work, published by Routledge, The Search for Stability, London Clerical Workers, 1880s, 1914. And even in that book, I mentioned magazines, right? Because what was interesting is every time I went to an archive, I went into Royal Bank Scotland, the first thing they would give me was, oh, you want to look at clerks? Here's company magazine. Look at that. They're in there right? And then it was like, hang on, what are these things, these magazines? And there's a chapter in my book, and I actually call it The Machine in the Office. And you know a lot of these huge, very fearful debates about AIs. Oh my God, AIs, the boogie monsters. It's almost like horror films. Why do we watch horror films? Human beings take enjoyment out of getting scared, right? And that's why we read newspapers half the time. They're like, oh God, do you know there were the same debates going on? <laughs> 120 years ago, about, oh my God, the typewriter, the adding machine. There's a huge, oh my, we're all going to get de skilled. We're all going to end up like those horrible manual. And of course, don't forget clerks, their families were manual. They kind of clawed out of factories and got into offices. They, oh my God. We're, and you get that narrative of, oh, skilled professionals are going to be made redundant, you know, and going to university was a waste. It's like the middle class terrifying itself through its, its own technology, if that makes sense. I think it's a load of rubbish. Before we all have nightmares and we start to not be able to sleep at nights reluctantly i think we have to come into land i'm afraid because i know we can carry on uh, what a rich debate we've had i mean it's, it's a huge amount to digest i think and i think 
with your permission, you have set us up for a, a third podcast and possibly beyond that. But I think let just if we can bring us into land, and it's almost an impossible question. But one of the things we like to do, as you know, in these podcasts is to give internal communication practice and some practical ideas they can then use and apply in their role. And I picked up lots from what you said, all the way from be careful of the use of language, use heritage. Remember that a lot of the stuff we're talking about now is being consistent, particularly your last point about we've all had fears about things are going to take our job and, and ruin our livelihoods. You've also talked about the importance of listening, of creating that curation, not creation, about creating the environment. So as we come into land now, I'm going to ask you both really for one thing that you would advise internal communicators listening to this podcast, they should do. One thing they should do. Joe, what's your take? Well, I suppose based on what I said before, given that internal comms seems to change when there's a crisis, it's kind of, as guests see how a crisis can be an opportunity would probably be the message and not necessarily something to panic about. Where's the opportunity there? And obviously, the cat mentioned there's lots of things that could be seen as a crisis at the moment. And I guess that's always the case. There's lots of things that could potentially become a big crisis. You're never sure which one will actually turn into the big crisis. I guess late 2019, probably a lot of us wouldn't have realised that COVID was going to become as big as it was. But of the things you mentioned, I guess, realistically, climate change is one that's not going away. So maybe trying to think about how the kind of working world is going to kind of like change maybe in the future different working practices and maybe a company's having to be shown to be kind of responsible and what does that actually mean for communication and will that kind of create opportunities perhaps for uh, people working in communication if the nature of work is going to be different in the future. Okay, so it's important to recognise the opportunity with a crisis, I think, without, if I'm paraphrasing what you're saying there. And then finally, thank you very much. Michael, your take on that, please? Yeah, well, totally echoing Joe as well. I think mine would be learn your past, really. I'm paraphrasing now, but he who forgets the the past repeats the same mistakes. And I think kind of echoing what Jen and I have been talking about for a long time is internal comms has such a long and amazing history. And it's just because it's changing. I get why that's happening. It's because it's so dynamic. People, it's almost you don't have time to catch your breath and look back. You're constantly dealing with the present and the future. But I think sometimes we do need to look back. And I think your listeners should do that for two reasons. I think that you can learn a lot from the past. Stuff's been done in the past. We need to stop thinking we're constantly reinventing the wheel and we can learn a lot from that past. But also, I think understanding your past liberates you. It frees you. It gives you agency because a lot of the time we're stuck. Institutionalization is a cage. And I'm sure I mentioned this before. One of the key texts on institutional theory was 1983 by DiMaggio and he called it re-examining the iron cage. And we're stuck in this cage of the past. We think this is what we, everything we do is normal. It's normative, but it's not. It's only normal because it's something happened in the past. If we go back to the past, we can unlock what we do. We can stop thinking things are always this way. And then we can reimagine different ways of being, different ways of doing, and different ways of thinking. And I, I think understanding the past enables you to do that. And what a brilliant way to conclude what's been a fascinating podcast looking at our history. Joe, Michael, we'd love to talk to you again a little bit later on into your uh, research when you're coming to that, I think that final stage of analysis. Uh, we look forward to that very much. But for now, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast episode. If you have, please like it and share it on your preferred digital channels. Help us spread the word to build a better, more connected and inclusive future of work.